All right, before we study, we have two uh, different events for this morning. First one is we are going to send off uh, one of our own. So Shana Warmberg has been with us most of her life. I mean, a good portion of it, right? And um, we are, as a church, a Calvary Chapel affiliate church. Uh, and she is going to be tomorrow driving to Reno. She is relocating there to work for Calvary Chapel magazine, which covers all things Calvary Chapel, right? So we're going to pray for her and send her off. And, uh, you know, we're going to pray God's blessing on everything that you're going to do. All right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Shana and we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to watch her grow up. And uh, Lord, to mature in Christ and become skilled and blessed. And Lord, then offered a position uh, to cover the things of the Lord in our little uh, corner of the Christian world. We pray that you'd bless her, not only just for all the practical stuff that I'm sure her uh, mom and her loved ones are worried about, the travel and the, you know, and just the logistics and getting situated, but ultimately, Lord, that you would bless her, that she would do what she does well unto you so that she could further the kingdom and uh, realize your special call on her life. We thank you for her. Uh, protect her spiritually and bless her there. And use this season in her life uh, as one that will uh, be fruitful for her and see her to the next uh, thing that you have for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to do is the McKinney's are going to come up. Uh, let's see. Todd's coming up. Krista... Anna, Max, and I think Krista asked for Lucinda to come up, and then the board is going to come up as well. We're all cram on up here. You want to come to this side, Krista? All right, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to, this morning, um, ordain Todd as uh, a pastor at Parkland Chapel. And so when we started Parkland Chapel now 18 years ago, uh, Todd and Krista uh, and their children were one of the first uh, families, the uh, first of the 12 of us. And uh, Anna was, uh, I always know how old Parkland Chapel is because of Anna and vice versa, right? So she was about six months old when we started the church. And um, so, you know, there, there are things that happen. The, the first group's very special to me, each of them uh, in their own way. But I didn't do much research when I planted a church, uh, but I did read one church planning book, and it said that if you went somewhere that you weren't from, that you need to either know someone uh, that was uh, from there or have someone that had influence uh, there or the church wouldn't make it, like, because everything about Christianity is really relational. And uh, so, you know, I didn't know how all that would work out. But what ended up happening was um, at one point early on in our church, um, although that core group were inviting people, if there were 50 of us in attendance a couple years in, uh, 40 of those people were attending because of either Lance Calvert or Todd and Krista. And um, at, at Anna's first birthday party, Todd made flyers and handed them out to all the people who were coming, you know, inviting them to our first Sunday morning service. So uh, he, along with Dave, were our two first elders, and uh, we've grown up together. You know, we, um, most of the time now, I mean, it might come as a shock to most of you, uh, pun in, it's, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've tried to pray a lot and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and do, you know, I think these are the best practices from the Bible, um, and keep the Lord at the center. But the, but the truth is, you know, I, Todd grew from, you know, as an elder, and, um, you know, he and his family uh, serving in almost any capacity here, uh, they're a good example of, uh, you don't always do what you're called to do, you do what's needed, and then you'll someday get to what you're called to do. Right? So there's a lot of people around here I'm thankful for doing a lot of things that you don't really feel like your first calling, but you're fulfilling a need for the kingdom, and it's probably the avenue to your next calling. And so what happened is Todd finished a career in 
uh, administration in the school district and retired a little bit early and came on to oversee operations here because the church got big enough that I was really fouling things up. And uh, his, his administration background has really changed things uh, because I just want to say this, it is in my mind that while, it, you know, you can always default and say it's Jesus. You know, that's a Sunday school answer to everything in the New Testament. The practical always makes the spiritual. Like there, if practical things don't happen and you can just look through the life of Jesus, he was real big on the practical to give people avenues to reach the spiritual. So he's come on to oversee all this. And uh, when we accept a calling, our families are there. You don't, you don't do it without your families. They just don't get as much of the exposure typically. So um, we believe that not only with his work with the youth, which you can see the fruit of, and all the people that have helped throughout the years. Uh, but then with administration, we're going to just, uh, when we ordain someone, we are just acknowledging what God has already done. Okay? So, in fact, Todd was very reticent to have this happen. <laughs> and we said, well, you might not, you know, see yourself as a pastor, but the rest of us do, so let's go ahead and do what God has already done. All right? And, in fact, if he wasn't reticent, it would, it would be a, a, a case to pause. We're going to pray, and uh, thank the Lord for this. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to get to do life with people and uh, the opportunity to get to see you uh, work in their lives until they finally, um, kind of by your spirit, plinko into their thing. And um, when we get to your thing, it might not always be the thing that we suspected, but Lord, uh, when we're there, it's, it's obvious, even if not to us, to almost everyone else. And I want to thank you for the McKinney's. Uh, they've been uh, great friends and co-laborers in Christ to Lucinda and I. And Lord, uh, there wouldn't be a Parkland Chapel without them, I have uh, no doubt. And so thank you for all the lives that they have touched and they are touching. And Lord, we want to pray your spirit rest upon Todd, essentially just to do all the things that he's been doing uh, with greater confidence. Uh, you know, not from the plaque that he's going to get, but from the fact that, you know, we all are in agreement of what you have already done. And so may this day encourage him when he's discouraged. Um, and may uh, the calling uh, be the prize, the upward call of God yeah, to salvation, to sanctification, and to service in this case. And we pray you bless his family. Lord, uh, I know, you know, we stand up here and we pop our, our heads up out of the hole and uh, the enemy wants a whack-a-mole. And so we pray that you just protect him from whack-a-mole. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys want to take out your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 44, that's where we're going to be this morning. If you're new here, uh, let me say a couple things. The first one is uh, I'm stuffed up this morning, so instead of blowing my honker in front of you guys, I'll probably cough a few times. You don't need to bring me any water. It wouldn't help. Whatever's going around is draining faster than I could wash it away. TMI, right? Uh, secondly... Um, the board that was up here will later tell me, look, don't say we don't know what we're doing, at least in front of people, okay? But, you know, I, I find um, that much of the Christian life, especially being a pastor, uh, have you, there was actually a story, you can look this up, about 10 years ago, there was a guy in a wheelchair uh, at a stoplight in a semi uh, was parked waiting for the light to turn green and the guy tried to cross the crosswalk. No joke, you can look it up. 
and uh, he got in front of the nose of the semi as the light turned green. The guy didn't see him, so he put it in gear, and when he hit the man in the wheelchair, it spun the wheelchair around, no joke, locked the handles into his bumper, and he took off down the road. And so he's driving down the road at road speed with this guy in a wheelchair, uh, just terrified for his life. And it was, I think, like 2007, so cell phones and people were dialing 911 and trying to flag the driver down, and the driver was waving, you know, at people. They're, like, pointing to the front. He's like, yeah, I know, the grill looks good or whatnot. Uh, I think it was Detroit. But anyway, they ended up uh, dispatching a ton of police cars to follow him as he turned into his yard where the truck was. They swarm him, and uh, then he gets out, and he realizes, you know, he's got a guy with a wheelchair uh, hooked to the front of his truck, you know. And um, so, you know, when I heard that story or saw it, I realized that, a lot of times, you know, what you project as a leader is if you didn't know anything about physics or you didn't know anything about trucks and trailers and wheelchairs, you might look at that and say, man, look at that little guy in that little machine pulling that big rig. <laughs> but reality is, as I mean, as a Christian leader, if we're going to be honest, we're the guy in the wheelchair just hanging off for dear life screaming, bearings don't fail me now, you know. A lot of times that's what it's like, and uh, that's okay um, because we're striving for God to get the glory, and then lots of times when people figure that out, they're like, well, it, it couldn't be him or the wheelchair. It's got to be got to be God. So all that said then, when I say I only work a half day a week, I do work a couple more hours than that. That's a joke too. So, okay, we're good now. The board won't have to censor me anymore. Chapter 44 of... Ezekiel. When we come to the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, um, what we find is that we are introduced to a mysterious uh, figure called the prince. And when we think about this prince, um, he is an interesting guy because he comes on the scene after we have had this in-depth description of uh, the millennial temple. So we're in a spot in Ezekiel that covers future things. And so in the last few chapters, we looked at the dimensions of this millennial temple. We looked at the memorial sacrifices, the same sacrifices that were in the Old Testament system. The Levitical law are present in the millennial temple, except these look back at what Christ has done. And they remember what he did on the cross. And then uh, all of that is really, in part, just a, a lead up to what matters most. And that's in chapter 43, the glory of God enters this temple. Just as the glory of God entered the tabernacle in the wilderness, just as the glory of God entered Solomon's temple, and after the glory of God had departed from the temple, then now the glory of God enters this millennial temple and resides there. And I should say that when you make it to this point in Ezekiel, uh, you have to know for all of the minutia and all of the stuff that's hard to understand in Ezekiel, Ezekiel's theme is the glory of God, and the book is bookended by the glory of God. It starts with this crazy vision into heaven, and it ends with the glory of God in the millennial kingdom dominating the whole earth. So with that as a backdrop, then in chapters 44 through 46, after this description of the temple, we get this uh, insight into the worship in the millennial temple. And two figures really stand out. Uh, one person, the prince, which we'll look at today, and then one group, the priests, plural, I want you to note, and we'll note this again next week when we look at the priests, there is no high priest present. So there are all these sacrifices, but there's no high priest, no atonement for sin because that's already been made, and Jesus Christ, the high priest, is present. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the prince this week and kind of overview three chapters. Next week, I'm going to take chapter 44 and dial down on the priests, and then we're going to close the book the following week in chapters 47 and 48. 
So with that, then uh, chapter 44, verse 1. Then he, that's the Lord, brought me, that's Ezekiel, back to the outer gate of the sanctuary which faces towards the east. But it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it, and therefore it shall be shut. As for the prince... Because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. And so we are introduced to this prince, and his introduction is connected to a gate, the east gate. I want you to note that it says here that in the millennial kingdom, the east gate will be shut because the glory of God, as we mentioned in chapter 43, verse 5, entered in through that east gate. And so the prince alone will be allowed to enter and exit in the millennial kingdom through that east gate. Now, ancient rabbis, ancient Jewish teachers, believed this prince was none other than Jesus. Uh, that's who we would see him as. They didn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. So they would say he is the Messiah. And since they missed their Messiah, Jesus, they are still looking for their Messiah, this chosen one, to enter through the East Gate. This is huge regarding their understanding of the kingdom. Now, I mention that to you because the history of this East Gate to this day is tied to the passage we just read, and those ancient rabbis' beliefs, which are still held to this day. They're still looking for their Messiah, who we know to be Jesus, to enter through that eastern gate. Now, that said, the old city, as it currently stands, has eight gates. What you have to understand about Jerusalem is it's a city of wars. It's been torn down and rebuilt multiple times, some 40 times. And so the modern city walls aren't the same city walls as at the time of this writing, but they're close. The old city now uh, is about the same size as the old city then, give or take. And so there are eight gates uh, in that current city wall. And the most prominent of those gates, the most prominent one is the golden gate to the right hand of your screen. That's also known as the eastern gate, or it's the beautiful gate. And it has such renown because from that eastern side, you would enter the temple from anywhere outside of Jerusalem primarily. It was the main entrance. So you would come over the Mount of Olives, and look down upon that eastern or golden gate, the temple setting behind it on the 40 or so acres of Temple Mount. Then you would descend down to the Kidron Valley and cross and go straight into that beautiful golden eastern gate to worship. And so the eastern gate is the most prominent and important of all gates. Now, that current city wall that is there. And if you go to Israel with us, you can walk on top of that wall. I've walked the whole circumference of the city on that wall. The current city wall was constructed by Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent in uh, 1535 AD. Uh, not 535, but 1535. Uh, excuse me. No, it was 535. It ended up about 1535. Now, all that said, uh, Suleiman, he was a um, he was a Muslim, and he's not Arab. He's Ottoman, and uh, he's he's known because of all of his great building projects. Now uh, he was uh, Suleiman walling this gate up. Yeah, I'm right. It's 1541. He was walling this gate up because um, of two things, and it's based upon the scripture that we read and the rabbi's understanding. Uh, so he rises to power and the 
you know, the Muslim Turks, they see that place from 1500 to about uh, 1917 when the British liberated from them Jerusalem, they oversee it. And since it had been in uh, Muslim hands up to this point, Arab Muslims, and there was already the Dome of the Rock on top and uh, the shrine, the mosque, they decided, look, this is now a Muslim holy site. They did that intentionally. We, we, we definitely have to keep out um, the Messiah. The rabbis believe their Messiah is coming. We now own the city of Jerusalem. The Muslims have really dominated Jerusalem since 600 AD when Islam rose to power all the way to now 1541. And uh, so Suleiman built these city walls, uh, you know, and then encompassed the, the Temple Mount. And he walled up the eastern gate to keep out the Messiah. They believe this so much. He's like, well, if the Messiah is going to come back through these gates, because they believe the prince was the Messiah, we're going to wall him up. And so if you go with us to Jerusalem right now, you can look at those uh, gates. That's the gates that kind of rise up in the middle of the wall. And you can then uh, look down and see it's, it's walled shut. And the Dome of the Rock, which is about where the temple would have been, sits kind of directly behind those uh, gates, the Eastern Gate. Now, what he did as well, is if you look at that picture, is he put a cemetery below the Eastern Gate. Because if you're Jewish and you're a Jewish Messiah, then he assumed you would be Orthodox and you could not, as an Orthodox Jewish Messiah, defile yourself with a dead body. <laughs> so uh, if... Uh, he could bust down the gates. He surely wouldn't enter defiled by a cemetery. So all this is planned, and that's how it is to this day with uh, Muslim Turks trying to keep out uh, the Jewish Messiah from entering. Now, little did the Jews know, nor the Muslims, that uh, the Messiah had already entered. So Suleiman builds this in 1541 B.C., shores up the walls, and then stops up the eastern gate. And uh, the Jews are still looking for the Messiah. And yet Jesus, he did just what I told you a while ago. He, and if you go to Israel, we walk this road. He started at the top of the Mount of Olives, and it's steep. He came down on his triumphal entry on a colt that had never been ridden. And people were throwing their clothes down. They were waving palm, palm branches, and they were quoting the 118th Psalm, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, salvation comes in the name of the Lord. He entered right across that Kidron Valley and rode right through the beautiful gate, the new gate, the eastern gate, the golden gate. He cleansed the temple. He there, the glory of God, Jesus, the Messiah, was in uh, that temple. That said, because of Jewish tradition, that's, go that's walled up even to this day. So that all, that all said, then when I read this section, and there's a lot of different things in this section, I ask myself, and then when I go to the, the site and I look at the fact that that gate is walled up and there's a cemetery below it to keep out this prince, who they believe is the Messiah, who really is the prince? Is he really the Messiah? That's the one question I, as a Bible student, have. So uh, I'm going to ask you the question I asked, and I'm going to take you through how I answered it. First thing is, uh, who is the prince? Well, um, I came up with this all by myself. Uh, he is the prince. That's important. He's not a prince. He's the prince. And we're not given any explanation other than, guess what? Here you go. He's the prince. He alone can enter through this east gate. And he alone sits before the Lord, right with the Lord and eats bread. That's what we know from what we just read. If you go on through with me uh, to the 45th chapter, then starting in the 7th verse, this prince, the prince, has himself his own appointed section in the holy district to live in. Verse 7 of chapter 45, the prince will have a section on one side or the other of the holy district, uh, and that's in the city's property, and one side will be to the west and one side will be to the east. Verse 8, the land shall be his possession in Israel, and my princes, there'll be other princes, but he is the prince, 
They shall no more oppress my people, but they shall give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. And so they will rule justly. So the prince has his own place to live, even though he can enter in and out of this uh, eastern gate. Now, he is mysteriously a prince, but he's also a priest, it seems. If you look in chapter 45 and the 16th verse, all the people of the land shall give offerings, notice not to the prince of Israel, but for the prince in Israel. And what's he going to do with them? It shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings at the feast, the new moons, the Sabbaths, and all the appointed seasons of the house of Israel. And he shall prepare the sin offering and the grain offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering to make atonement for the house of Israel. So the prince makes offerings for the people. And yet he also makes offerings for himself. Because look in verse 22, on that day, the day they celebrate Passover, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. And so he has to, just like the Old Testament priest, prepare an offering for himself. And yet, there is some kind of intermediary work here because he also observes and officiates both Passover and tabernacles at the very least. Look in verse 21 of chapter 45. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall observe Passover, a feast of seven days, and unleavened bread shall be eaten on it. And then he's going to give offerings. Here's the offerings of those seven days. And then in verse 25, in the seventh month, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. It starts on that seventh month, on the 15th day of the month, at the feast, he shall do likewise for seven days, according to the sin offering and the burnt offering and the grain offering and the oil. So he officiates these two for sure, ancient Jewish feast or festival days that were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And there may, or it seems to be other holy days that he also officiates. Now when we think about this, uh, just let me uh, bring you back kind of into focus here. One of the benefits to reading the Bible over and over is hopefully you start to glean some of the meta-narratives that are in there, the ones that kind of start at the beginning and weave themselves through to the end. And while lots of people uh, reject the Old Testament out of hand, uh, there really is no New Testament Christianity completely without understanding the old, because Jesus is the old uh, fulfilled revealed. And so in the festivals of Israel, these feasts that were appointed both spring and fall, we have this outline of, say, uh, Judeo-Christian history. And we've covered some of this before, but I just want to take a second to go through this. They had four spring feasts, uh, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. And what would happen is when Jesus came, he would fulfill all of those on the very day at his first advent or his first coming. And so he came as the Passover lamb. And Passover was to be celebrated by them year after year because it was their, their starting point. It was God liberating them from Egypt. And the way that he liberated them was a lamb was taken into a family and it lived with the family for four days, and they killed it, and they spread its blood on the doorposts, and they ate the meal with the lamb, and then they were covered from the death angel, and then they were thrust out of Egypt and into freedom, if you will. And Jesus came, Egypt being a type of the world, and that captivity there, a type of sin, and that blood symbolic of the need for blood to have remission of sin by the Lord's dictate. When they would celebrate that, they were celebrating that. And then Jesus came and said, behold, I, I'm the lamb of God. John the Baptist said, there he is. He takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus fulfilled Passover on the very day. He was killed as the Passover lamb on Passover. He then was in the ground during the feast of unleavened bread, 
Unleavened bread happened the two days after the Passover because then it was to put away sin. And Jesus was in the ground. Sin was put away, buried with him in the ground for two days. And then the third day was the Feast of First Fruits, where they would celebrate the first fruits of the spring harvest. So they would make offerings and say, man, there's going to be more to come. And Jesus rose uh, from the dead, leaving sin there with him for any who would trust in him. And he became the first fruits of salvation, is what Paul says in Corinthians. And then we are fruits after him, we who follow. And then 50 days later, they had the Feast of Pentecost. And for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and first fruits, people would often stick around in Jerusalem for 50 days to celebrate Pentecost. And Pentecost was like this ultimate celebration of the full harvest of the spring planting. And truly then on that day of Pentecost, uh, which by the way, the ancient rabbis believed that it was on Pentecost that law was given on Mount Sinai and 3,000 died. There in the New Testament, in Acts chapter two, the church was birthed, if you will, and the law of liberty was given and 3,000 were saved. The Holy Spirit, after Jesus has ascended, now comes upon the church, which was fulfilled, each one of these, to the very day that they would celebrate them. Then you have the spring feast completed and the church established and you enter in in human history to what we know as the church age. This time that's unlike any other where uh, God is, by his grace, growing himself a family and a kingdom, as it were. And then we believe that the fall feasts, which began in September, will also be fulfilled by Jesus on the very day. And that began with the Feast of Trumpets, where they would, it's called the day that no one knows, the, the feast that no one knows the day or the hour of, because it could happen on one or two days. And you blow the trumpet for that feast, and that kind of initiates the celebration of the fall harvest. And we believe that's connected to the Feast of Trumpets, the rapture of the church being taken away, and then God judging the world, where when he comes back with those he has taken, he comes back with the armies of heaven and the clouds of heaven and sets his feet down physically on the Mount of Olives, enters that eastern gate, whether there's a wall there or not, so physically and gloriously, then that's commensurate with the Day of Atonement, which would put away sin, essentially, and set things right. And then Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, it is a symbol of the Millennial Kingdom, where God will rule and reign and bless and use uh, Judah and Jerusalem as the center, uh, the epicenter of the world spiritually and governmentally. And so tabernacles, it's, it's quite a thing. And it's, uh, as you think about it and as you read through your scripture, it's a picture of the millennial kingdom. Now, all that said, uh, I want you to look at the 46th chapter in verse 9 real quick. <clears throat> When the people of the land come before the Lord on this appointed uh, day or days, on the, the feast days where you celebrate the Lord and the prince there is in officiation, whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate, and whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by the north gate, and he shall not return by the way of the gate through which he came, but he shall go out through opposite gates or out another gate, out the opposite gate. And the point is this, um, they were supposed to come in one way, leave another way, which when I'm looking through and reading through like this and looking for something to take away devotionally, this is something that I think kind of stands out above everything else. And my conclusion, just simply a way to apply it is that just like these folks, we're not supposed to leave the house of the Lord the same way we entered. It's the, one of the many points of assembly. And so often, you know, people do just straggle in and straggle out unchanged. But there's a purpose for this assembly, intentional assembly together. And I think about, uh, and I told First Service this, the southern steps have been uncovered at the base of the wall in Jerusalem. And the southern steps 
Uh, when we go to Jerusalem, we sit there where they believe Peter did preach on the day of Pentecost to the thousands, and we, we cover that scripture there. We, we do a short Bible study. And one of the things that is noticeable is how the steps were actually constructed. When you read about Solomon constructing these steps, it's much like this detail in Ezekiel. It's, it's hard to figure out, like, why would I care, right? I don't know if you've thought that, but why would I care about all this? Like, let's just get to Jesus. And then you go there, and you try to walk 20 or 30 steps up this 100-foot section of steps. There were 200 feet of steps. They have about 100 feet uncovered. And you find out that, ah, I, I should have taken a little more time to think about Solomon's steps as described in the Old Testament, they're each step between 18 and 32 inches, which, which doesn't seem like it's a big deal. But if this step is 18 inches and this step is 32 inches and the next one's 24 inches, what happens is this. When you try to walk up those steps, you cannot be surfing on your book of faces and do it because you will stumble. You'll fall flat on your face. And so while the Bible doesn't tell us this, quickly when you experience it, you go to yourself, why would Solomon do that? God had him design it so that you could not enter the temple without thinking about it. It was meant to make you set aside whatever else you were thinking about, and you had to think about each step, or you're going to fall on your face in front of all your spiritual buddies. And so, too... When we enter the house of the Lord, what God desires for us is to come in with an intention to receive something here that we wouldn't get anywhere else. <clears throat> and the reality is this. It's kind of in vogue now in Western culture for people to say something like, I love Jesus or I am plenty spiritual. I just don't like the church. I'll say something that's not very in vogue, but it's much more biblical. If you don't like the church, you don't like Jesus. Jesus's body is the church. He is the head of the church. And so not everything that happens in the body of Christ is reflective of Jesus. But Jesus himself said, this is the one way that you will know that you're my disciples is if you love my disciples. You'll love to be around him, which is why the writer to the Hebrews said, don't forsake this assembly. It's important. Why? Well, number one, Christianity is not about me, but we're supposed to be others centered. This is hard. I'm a little bit further along at 50 than I was at 30. Maybe not that much. But as a Christian, as you mature, you're supposed to understand that my presence at church, my very presence is a ministry. There's something that I bring, whether I know it or not, that God values. So I intentionally go to a local church because I am the body of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. And he fits us together in this local church to reflect something of him that no other church in our area reflects. And when I am not here, it matters to God, it matters to others, and it should matter to me. And so there are people that cannot come to church. And that's a different situation. Because the heart is always the heart of the matter. But what we find is that when we do assemble, it's for a reason. In that, I'm guessing, most of you avoid these sections of Ezekiel. All right? You get some stuff in your devotion. Maybe you're like, man, I got something better this morning in my devotion. This guy's giving me why I even show up because you wouldn't read this. And this is the word of God. I sometimes do worship in my car passionately and I would say beautifully. But it's not the same as worshiping here. It's not the same. You get something in the body of Christ. His presence is with us as we assemble, which means intentionally showing up for our part that we don't get anywhere else. And that's New Testament Christianity. So I'm hoping that no matter how I feel, I'm going to lay that aside and not leave the same way that I showed up. That's one of the intentions of worshiping together. Now, uh, that said, 
Let's take one last look at the prince before we try to wrap this thing up. Who is the prince? You probably already forgot about him by now. Verse 16 of chapter 46, we get our last clue of this guy. The prince, if he wants to give gifts of inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to them. There you go. He has sons, and that inheritance is their possession. So this prince, this mysterious guy, they just burst onto the scene. Uh, who is he? I would love for him to be Jesus. It would be my greatest joy as a Bible teacher to make a case for him being Jesus. But I have to tell you, based upon my elementary findings, dear Watson, he is not. He is not Jesus. Uh, some people think he is David because of what we read in Ezekiel 37, 25, uh, that my servant David shall rule over you. Some people think he's a descendant of David. I guess if I was voting, I'd cast my vote there. Here's what I do know, and I came up with this all by myself. He's a privileged uh, prince, the prince, with priestly duties. That's the best I can figure. Now, I'm sure that you're wondering why did I show up this morning? Like, how does that, <laughs> how does that relate to me at all? Like, what in the world? And yet, um, that's how I kind of want to close with that thought in mind. He is a pretty outstanding guy, this prince. Uh, he's got me beat by a nose because he's a prince and a priest. And in the Old Testament, there were only three offices that mattered, really, in all of uh, Israel. Prophet, priest, and king. And no one person could hold all three offices. Uh, in fact, David, good reason why people do think this guy could be David, he, you could make a case for, was a king who sometimes acted as a prophet and sometimes kind of dabbled in priestly duties, but he was not all three. You know, maybe you could kind of force fit some people into priest and king or king and prophet and maybe if that's the case, you'd be like the 70s troubadour meatloaf, and you'd say, two out of three ain't bad. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to cut it compared to Jesus. Because those three offices that went hand in hand with all of these Levitical sacrifices and all of the way that the government was woven in with the worship in Old Testament Israelology, then so too that will be the case in the millennial kingdom. And the only person to ever hold all three of those offices and fulfill them is Jesus. He's the prophet that Moses actually said, there would be a prophet come after me, a prophet with a capital P that will do signs and wonders like me, essentially greater than me. And then the priest. Again, John the Baptist declared what Jesus would say of himself. I came to take away sins. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus claimed to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Jesus is always at the epicenter of everything that we study in the New Testament. And whether we see him or not, here's the thing. Jesus said, uh, two guys who knew the Bible probably way better than I know the Bible he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find life, but behold, they testify of me. Every one of them, which makes them all important. And so this prince, I don't get it why he's in here, and I'm not for sure about who he is, but he's not Jesus, and he's not as great as Jesus. But I would say this. Maturity requires that we go past the, as the writer to the Hebrews would say, the elementary things or the ABCs of the faith. He wrote to the Hebrews who they were actually regressing because all they wanted to talk about was salvation and baptism and getting people saved. And while those things are important, Paul said, if you want to be mature, if Paul indeed wrote Hebrews, we could thumb wrestle over that. But that said, the writer said, if you want to be mature, which is the goal of Christianity, maturity, then you got to go past the ABCs of the faith. And as I come down the home stretch, I just want to say this. On a Thanksgiving weekend, I'm thankful for you guys for that. Um, 
I struggle. I don't know about you, but I struggle with thanks. Lots of times I don't like this about myself. I can be a glass half empty guy. I can always find more things to complain about than I can to be thankful for. That's my default. And yet I've always been distinctly convicted of in Romans chapter one, where there's description of those who are going to bust hell wide open. Uh, one of the key phrases is, nor were they thankful. So I'm hoping and praying that I'll become more thankful the more time God gives me. And I do believe thankfulness is a sign of maturity. It's one of the indicators. It's hard for us because we have so much to actually be thankful for. All that said, I'm thankful for you guys because Ezekiel is indeed a glorious book. I believe that. But it's not an easy book. And so it's neglected by a bunch of people. And I want to have two quotes here from uh, one guy that's more recent. He just passed away, a pastor named R.C. Sproul. He said, here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in God's word, not so much because it's difficult to understand or that it's dull or boring, but because it's work. Our problem's not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. I uh, say we, and that means me. Nari Tori, who succeeded famous D.L. Moody, said 99 in every 100 Christians are merely playing at Bible study. And therefore, 99 in every 100 are mere weaklings when they might be giants, both in their Christian life and their service. And so I would say this, we are, as a church, distinct in one way in that we're going to attempt to teach you every uh, chapter in the Bible, and most of those verse by verse. And what we believe is it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And so you understand, if you've been exposed to other church, distinctly we are a discipleship church instead of a convert church. Yes, we want to see people converted, but that's not the goal of Christianity. The goal of Christianity is to see people converted and made into mature disciples. And the difference between our approach and most of the churches down the street, which doesn't make us any better or any worse, but I hope it's more biblical, is that instead of this being the place where people come and get saved, this is the place where you guys who know Jesus grow, and then you go convert people, and they come and grow into disciples. Do you understand? And that's the biblical model. Changed people changed people, okay? And so discipled people disciple people. And so in order to do that, we need the whole counsel of God, and it's not always easy, but it is beneficial. Now, on the other side of that, there are some of us that are like, I don't want anything I don't understand. Just give me the red letters, man. I'm into that. That's one side of the equation. Then the other side is the people who love to dial down so hard. It's like, we're down in the foxhole. Could we sink a mine shaft here? Could, I mean, I want to burrow for every nugget. And I tell you what, I got scriptures to defend everything you say. And I'm like, we don't want any of that either. I mean, if that's you, have fun in your personal life. Don't bring it out here. Paul said of those people in 1 Timothy, man, stop with, the, <laughs> stop with the endless genealogies and all the wranglings about stuff like a prince that is pretty cool but really doesn't matter. And so you say, well, if it's pretty cool but it really doesn't matter, why did we just spend 45 minutes of my time on it? I'd say this. Proverbs 25.2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Can you think about that for a second. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search out a matter. You may say, that's great. I'm not a king. Yes, you are. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a son or a daughter of the king. And everything that Jesus has, you and I will inherit. And one of the glories of God, because you know this, if you have relationships that you value, you love it when somebody puts a little effort into figuring out who you are. And so God conceals some things intentionally to see if the kings, the queens, will search out a matter. And when we search it out, he will be found. And I'll uh, end with this uh, little hope. It has been my hope. Someone said it one time, and I wonder if it won't be true. I'm not for sure whether it will or won't. But I believe that in heaven, we won't just know everything. I think we will progressively learn still. And I, I hope, and I, I wonder if, some of that won't be, can you imagine daily Bible studies by Jesus? And I should say, one of the reasons I sit is because ancient rabbis sat, but, you know, I just want to just for a second uh, 
cause you to be a little thankful for my grace and the mercy that I have just as a man of God. And that's it. In the old, the old times, the priests or the teachers, the rabbis, they sat and the people stood. So see, I let you sit with me. It's a gracious thing, right? Can you imagine enduring this deal standing the whole time? <laughs> There'd be three of you. But, um, but that said, you know, as, as you think about that, then there's this, this beautiful understanding that um, the rabbis taught people, and Jesus is our chief rabbi. He was known as rabbi. So imagine in heaven, him teaching every day, and it's a Bible study that just pins your ears back. I mean, blown away. I'm talking wheelchair on the front of a semi-Bible study, right? Just can you imagine, you know, if he wasn't muddling through anything? And then think about this. Maybe, just maybe, we're allowed, we're allowed to think, hey, I figured that out about the prince back in 2023, but man, look at all the stuff I didn't know. God revealing the whole of the matter himself for all of eternity. I don't know, but I feel like this is a little bit of a poor man's glimpse of that when we do this. And I'm thankful for you because you're not like every other Christian, and that's okay. But since God's called us to be who we are, I'm thankful for you guys sitting through this because I think in eternity, and maybe only eternity, are we going to get our full return on our investment of Ezekiel chapter 44, 45, and 46. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for the things we know and the things we don't know. Uh, we thank you for the fact that the things we do on this earth are obviously going to matter later and we praise you for all the stuff that you know eyes not seen and ears not heard you know what you have waiting for us in eternity and so we pray that for these here in jesus name amen Would you guys stand